Welcome, welcome. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to Bantu Book Review again this week. Let's get started. Okay, so we're jumping right into Hate It or Love It. Up this week, we have The Fire Next Time by the one, the only James Baldwin, author, activist, social critic, you name it, he embodies it. In my opinion, The Fire Next Time should be required reading for every American citizen. There is something about the way that James Baldwin phrases just very simple things that we know and understand about America, about, well, some of us know and understand about America and about the world and about um, the politics of our political and social climate. But it's just something way, something about the way that he says it that just makes it even more clear than it has been and gives you the ammunition you need to do something or say something. So this week I'm saying something about what has been said to me in the fire next time. I'm feeling a fire in my chest. I'm feeling the fire. I'm feeling inspired. That is the emotionally intelligent word of the day. Um, I'm fired up. So just a little context before we jump in. Um, The book came out in 63 at the time of the civil rights movement. Um, It gave voice to a lot of the things that were happening in the movement. And of course, um, James Baldwin was rocking with, excuse me, I'm going to sniffle a lot because I have a cold, but James Baldwin was rocking with the heavy hitters of that time. Um, The leaders that we know, love, respect, and appreciate Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is also a person that he... um, encountered and conversed with um so that's that's the historical backdrop it's the civil rights movement in america this is from the perspective of a black man um in america so in this week's section of hate it or love it what i'm gonna do is talk about the things that i loved and the things that i hated I mean, I didn't really hate them, but there are things that I agree with and things that I didn't agree with. So you can give me your, uh, give me your opinions about where you stand. Um, but there are so many important points that were made in this book. So many things that were covered that are just so crucial as far as conversation, as far as activism. So let's start with what I loved. What I loved is that the book... I mean, he speaks the truth, right? He knows his stuff. Um, His opinions are rooted in fact in the things that are true, the things that cannot be contested and cannot be denied um, by people who care about the facts, at least. Uh, Because, you know, people who are delusional will deny anything. It doesn't matter if it's true. Facts don't even come into the picture with some folks. Um, we're being led by one such person, um, the German Shepherd in uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue in D.C. is one such person. But anyway, what I love most is just the fact that tr- the truth is, is something that he articulates very well. Um, and so not only is he telling the truth, he has... A perspective that is solution oriented. He has an eye toward the future. So he's talking about the problems of the times. He's talking about social injustice. He's calling out the ignorance of this country. He's calling out the mistakes that we have made and he's discussing the consequences of those actions. But he's also talking about what needs to be done now that we have this information about what has happened and what is happening. Um, Like I said, I don't agree with everything that he says in the way of, well, I guess I didn't say that yet, but I'm saying it now. I don't agree with all of his uh, recommendations for how to handle things, but I appreciate that he does have a suggestion and he does have recommendations because it's not enough to talk about problems. So he has solutions and that's really important. Uh, The other thing that I love, 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 love is that He has conversations with people who disagree with him. 
And that's so important. I am still learning how to do that because I think in a lot of ways, I don't have tolerance for people who, number one, are delusional and um, number two, are not concerned with the facts. Like I just kind of shut those people out. I do not engage in order to preserve my uh, mental space and energy and just block out nonsense. I just sort of don't engage. But there are times in the book when he's engaging actively in conversations and he's still positive and like solution oriented and forward thinking in spite of like fundamentally disagreeing with the things that people have to say. And I really admire that. Um, not able to do that yet, like I said, but I really admire that. I love that. Um, the other thing that I love is that, um, I mentioned that he's positive, um, and that positivity lends itself to a level of optimism that I think is needed because he has faith in where we are able to go in spite of where we've been. And also an important thing that's happening in this book is that he's actually writing a letter to his nephew, a person that he loves, which maybe informs the tone that he takes when he's saying the things that he's saying. He's talking about the state of America um, at the time of the civil rights movement. And of course we know like it's crazy back then. It's crazy now, but it was crazier then. Um, but he's talking about this in a way and like he doesn't sound bitter. He doesn't sound, not that it matters because you have, we have every right to be upset about the things that have happened and the things that have continued to happen. But his message is, is more received by anyone with the tone that he takes and with the approach that he takes. Um, and I think like the fact that he doesn't get emotional, at least the emotion is not the focus here. It makes his words more powerful and it makes the message more clear because it's not clouded with judgment and all these other things. Um, so yeah, um, he's a truth teller. He's not being emotional. He's not solely concerned with emotions. Um, he is a person who has friends from every perspective in every walk of life. And so he can see both sides and he all sides, many sides, not all sides. He can see many sides and the angle and that perspective that he has knowing, hey, I've got white friends that I love and that love me. And I grew up in a black household, in a black community, in black America, and in a certain position. Um, so I have that perspective too. It, it's just, he's well-rounded in the way that he approaches these issues that fundamentally plague our society then and now. Um, but also, he's realistic what I love is that his optimism does not make him delusional. He's very realistic about the fact that optimism is what's needed, love is what's needed, but it is not going to be attained under the current circumstances and under the current ways that we're dealing with problems. Like We cannot persist in this way if we're ever to get to where we need to be. That's important. Um, he is an author. He's a social commentator. So for him, language is critical. He knows that words mean things. We all know that, but I think he takes language very seriously and he's careful with his words and the nuances and the way that he says things really like brought some things to my attention um, and, and helped me to address some of the biases that I have personally um, and some of the issues with the the frame of reference that I have as well. Um, but I'm going to point out a couple of quotes um, to kind of be more clear. I feel like I'm being vague, um, but I just want to get like him and be more precise with my language and more precise with my words. Um, he says, the details and symbols of your life, again, he's talking to his nephew, have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. Please try to remember that what they believe as well as what they do and cause you to endure does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity and fear. 
So that distinction that he makes is really important, which is you're not responsible for what other people believe about you. You're responsible for knowing the truth of who you are. That is important. There's another um, quote. I'm going to find it really quickly, but it, it made me realize, okay, I can't find the quote, but what it made me realize because there was something about the way that he... I wish I could find this quote, but I can't. Anyways, my conclusion after reading his words was... The belief is a choice in a lot of ways. Um, there are things that we believe that are true. And things that we believe that are not true. And James Baldwin constantly asserts throughout this text that American ignorance in particular is willful. And Americans have chosen, some Americans have chosen, to not believe certain things because believing those things that are in fact true would illuminate more about Americans than Americans care to believe. He says something to that effect. He said it better than I did, but that's what he said. Um, And he says, these people, they, they, this is the direct quote, it's incomplete, but he says, they would not believe me precisely because they would know that what I'm saying is true. And that's really powerful, man, because... When people are delusional, it is detrimental, especially when delusional people are also decision makers. Um, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really problematic. It's especially problematic when the delusional people are the decision makers because you're making decisions that are like misinformed. They're, they're not the right decisions when you're not concerned with what is true and what is correct. Um, And he says, rightfully, that a civilization is not destroyed by wicked people. It is not necessary that people be wicked, but only that they be spineless. And that's one of the reasons why my word of the day is inspired. Um, And fired up is the phrase. Because it's true that it's not enough to know what's true. It's not enough to have the knowledge of the truth and of the facts. You have to take it a step further. You have to go above and beyond knowledge to action. Um, so, yeah. He he really, he got me going with this. Um, let me see, let me see. More things that I loved. I loved so many things. This One thing that I did in this book, I highlighted so much of the book that it's not immediately clear what is the most important because I feel like everything is so important. But overall, I really, I really love this book. Um, last thing I'll say about what I loved before moving on to what I hate is um, he talked about the beauty of the struggle, right? Uh, we spend so much time critiquing America and, 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 you know, talking about the issues with the position that we find ourselves as black Americans, as black people in America. Um, But he talks about the beauty of the struggle and the power of resilience and the consequences of that resilience when it comes to recognition of what is true and recognition of what is real, um, what what, what matters. He says, if one is continually surviving the worst that life can bring, one eventually ceases to be controlled by a fear of what life can bring. Whatever it brings must be born. It's like, listen, it is what it is. You got to deal with this and you will. And it's just really that simple. And, and for people who live their lives that way, they're some of the most real people, the most solid and the most raw. And, and real is not something you can imitate. You can't buy that. Um, what I will say, though, is that Yes, we've grown resilient and we've been able to endure a lot of bullshit, but we shouldn't have to and we deserve better. 
Um, so that that brings me to what I didn't like so much. I don't hate it. This is what I didn't like. I think in some ways we were charged by James Baldwin with the task of being our brother's keeper in some ways and being responsible to teach people, white people, those white people who are willfully ignorant and, and delusional, I think he sort of made it our responsibility to, to care for them and to help them see the error in their ways. And I don't think that that's my responsibility at all. I think that when you don't know something, you should learn. Um, and I do think that teachers are important, but I don't think that it is the responsibility of black people to teach white people what they don't know about themselves because they have made choices. And now you have to own your choices and correct your choices on your own. I think accountability has to come from within. I don't think that I can be responsible for helping somebody else be responsible, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, weigh in. Let me know what you think. Um, maybe this isn't what he meant. Maybe you took away something different. Let me know. Um, but yeah, um, I think that black people have been cleaning up the messes of white people for long enough. And I think that's a part of the problem. Like white people have not had to account for their actions. They have not had to be responsible because the cleanup crew was coming right behind them. We always got to fix it. No. It's, that's not my responsibility. It's really not. Um, there are more important things that I have to attend to than to, to solve the problems that you manufactured. So you fix it. You, you go ahead and handle that. You do your work, and I'm going to continue to do my work. Um, so that's what I didn't like. Um, but let me know if I didn't get it right. Um, I'm going to wrap up this section with the bottom line. Um, by saying, I do agree in general um, that peace and love is mostly what the world needs now. It's what America needs now. It's what we all need now. But before we get to love, we need respect. We need reconciliation. We need real. We need to truly, all of us, understand what is going on. Uh, we need to respect one another uh, before we get to love, like, it's, it's not enough for the kumbaya and the feel good and all this stuff. We need respect. We need to be respected. And reconciliation needs to happen. And that happens when people get real about what's happening. And when people stop believing what they want to believe and only choosing to see the pretty things and the beautiful things about America. We have to address the ugly face of America. There's an ugly face. There's a beautiful face right the made up face is beat right it looks great and then we need to go a step further and dig a little deeper and and see those problems that we have and correct those problems so yeah we need to see america as it is not as we would like it to be because i think you know we we got a lot of hypocrisy going on we got a lot of phrases we got a lot of platitudes and things that we say right liberty and justice for all all these things we say that right we have to actually mean it um and people have to know that like black people ain't going nowhere so y'all can stay mad uh but we're gonna stay woke and we're gonna do our work within ourselves and on ourselves and other people have to do their work as well so yeah um the emotionally intelligent word of the day with that being said is inspired uh, which means fill someone with the urge or ability to do or feel something, especially to do something creative, to animate someone with such a feeling, to give rise to. I'm definitely inspired to do the work on myself. And then, you know, once I'm working on me, I can work on some other things about my situation, about the society that I'm a part of. Um, so, yeah, we got to we gotta all work on ourselves first and foremost. Um Yes, moving on, moving on. I want to shout out. And shout out is connected to the so what, the why, why does this matter? There's so many people, there are so many people who are doing the work. They have responded to all of the calls to action. They've come up with their own solutions. Um, one such person, 
Her name is Diana O. Aromaselli. She is a black engineer who has a website, categorizedtweets.com. Categorizedtweets.com. Her Twitter handle is Lectures to Beats. On her website, categorizedtweets.com, you can enter your zip code and it will pull up your representatives, your political representatives, um, based on your location, based on your zip code. And then it scans the Twitter timelines of your politicians and sorts their tweets into several category court categories, um, which would, you know, allow you to see what they really think about important issues um, that they'll ultimately be making decisions concerning, such as econ- the economy, race, immigration, gun laws, education. Um, go on the website, see all the categories, but also take a look at what your representatives have to say um, and use this information to make informed decisions um, in the elections that are coming up. Um, voting is important. Uh, but yeah, Diana did a really important thing with this website. Um, not only does her website group the tweets by category, but it also allows you to see each tweet or the lack thereof, because I definitely went on the website and checked out my representatives and my legislators, for example, their Twitter fingers are not strong. And I can see just by using this website that they don't have anything to say on the issue of race. Um, There are two representatives that I can see at this moment. Um, And yeah, they don't care about, not that they don't care. They're not tweeting actively about the issues that are important to me. Um, So that might be something to consider when voting later on um, in these elections that are coming up. The other important thing about Diana is that not only is she awesome, not only does she do something that's important, that's needed, that's helpful, she's been really responsive to constructive feedback and she's incorporating helpful tips um, concerning improvements to the site and to future iterations. So yeah, check her out. Check out the website again. That was categorizedtweets.com. And when you're done checking her out, because she's got some way more important things going on. Um, come check me out on Twitter as well, at Bantu Book Review. Um, I'm going to leave you guys with some questions of my own this week for the audience engagement. I have some questions, so hit me up with your answers at Bantu Book Review on Twitter and Bantu Book Review at gmail.com. My question, how do you treat assholes in the workplace? <laughs> We know that not everybody is responsive to compassion or good intentions, but when there's a conflict, how do you deal with these kinds of people, right? Second part of the question, what about when the dynamic of power is such that this person or these people who are apathetic are also decision makers and in charge? What do you do? Is it an option to not engage at all? I need, I need answers. So hit me up and let me know. The last thing I will leave you with is a random rant. Okay. This is for social justice, racial justice allies, right? I was on the Twitter venting to no one about nothing when I came across something important. I don't remember what it is, but I remember that it made me angry first and then it made me think. So briefly, White allies, this is for y'all. Instead of spending so much time trying to get people to love you and to accept you as not like the others, woke or whatever other aspirational label you seek, worry about correcting your immediate family members and friends that are actively hating and terrorizing people on a regular basis, right? Some of these people who again are your family and friends are positioned to make some really important decisions that directly affect the people that you advocate for on a regular basis. Check them. Correct them. Okay? Um, That'll make you more effective as an ally. So, yeah. I'm done for this week. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening at Bantu Book Review. Bye. Uh-huh.